Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. This is Rick Loiza, and with me again is Jacob. What's up, Jacob? Hey, Dad. How you doing? Doing well. Today, we're going to talk about John Wooden. Do you know who he is? Yeah, wasn't he that uh, world-renowned coach at uh, UCLA? Yes, he coached UCLA to 10 national championships, which at the time was a record. It has since been broken by Gino Ariema over at UConn. He has 11. But yeah, we're today we're talking about John Wooden uh, from UCLA. Except today we're going to talk about more about his playing days before mm. he got into coaching. What most people don't realize is that John Wooden is in the Hall of Fame as a player and a coach. Really? So he is the first player to go into the Hall of Fame two times. Uh, since he did it, three other guys have done it, but he was the first one. So he was in the Hall of Fame as a player, and this was before he ever even won his first national championship. And then later, after he won all those national championships, he was inducted in the Hall of Fame as a coach. Wow. Yeah, so he is a really important figure in basketball. His playing days go all the way back into the 20s and 30s, and then his coaching days started uh, pretty much as soon as he retired from basketball. He got into coaching high school then college, and then UCLA uh, before he retired. Well, okay. So what made the story stick out to you? Why did you want to talk about his playing days as opposed to his coaching days? Well, there's so much written about him, about his coaching days. A ton has already been written about that. So I didn't want to just copy what other people had done. But I did notice there's not a lot about his playing days. So that's where I wanted to focus today's story on. Cool. Well, I'm sure listeners will be very excited to hear what you have to say about that. All right. Well, let's get started. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back, basketball history aficionados. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we are going to talk about excellence. There are some people who are just really good at almost everything they try. Some of it might come from natural talent or disposition. Some of it might come from hard work. But more often than not, it comes from a combination of both. But how does someone reach a world-class level of excellence in two related but still unique disciplines? What drives someone to be the absolute best at something? Hopefully, we can answer that today. The subject of today's story is the first person to be inducted individually into the Hall of Fame twice. His name is John Wooden which should be obvious since that's the name of the episode as you clicked on it. You see, before he ever won his first championship as the coach at the University of California at Los Angeles, or UCLA, he had already been inducted into the Hall of Fame as a player. But often, we don't hear about his playing days. We only hear about his coaching days. So let's talk about his upbringing and playing career. John Wooden was born on October 14, 1910 in Hall, Indiana to Joshua and Roxy Wooden. His parents were farmers and they lived in a house with no electricity or indoor plumbing. Coach Wooden was raised along with his three brothers as farm kids. He did have two sisters, but each died before their second birthdays. His home was filled with love and discipline. It's hard to grow up on a farm and not have a sense of discipline. Farm life is hard. There is no such thing as sleeping in. Chickens need to be fed, cows need to be milked, 
and chores need to be completed. The farm doesn't take a day off. And it was this discipline and approach that he brought to his development as a basketball player. During his high school days, his family moved to the town of Martinsville, where he played on the school's basketball team. He was a three-time All-State player, and as a senior, led his team to the Indiana State Championship in 1927. And that is no small thing. In the state of Indiana, where high school basketball dominates the sports scene, being a state champion gives you legendary status. And if you are the leader of the team, like Wooden was, you're basically the king of the town. You and your teammates will be talked about for decades. He was 5 foot 10 or 178 centimeters, and he played guard who earned the nickname the Indiana Rubber Man because of the way he bounced up off the floor. He dove for every loose ball around. He was an incredibly intense player. He was the kind of player that would sometimes rub opposing fans the wrong way. If he was on your team, you loved him. But if he was on the other team, you hated him. He approached every single possession like the Earth's survival depended on it. He had an absolute fire in his belly to win basketball games. After an extremely successful high school career, he would then move on to Purdue University, where he was all Big Ten and all Midwest. And he was also the first player in college history to be a three-time consensus All-American. Many other players have since also been named three-time All-Americans, but only Coach Wooden can say that he did it first. He graduated with a degree in English in 1932. Then he moved on to a semi-pro career. Back in the 1930s, professional basketball was a part-time job. The NBA would not come into existence for about another 15 years. In 1930s pro basketball wasn't anything like today's NBA. Every player had to have some sort of day job because playing basketball was just for some extra cash and not much more. A good player might get $25 to $40 per game, which is nothing to sneeze at in the 1930s. It's like making $300 to $400 per game in 2020. Yes, that's nice money for playing a single basketball game, but you would still have to do something else for income. And he taught high school, as well as being the head coach of the high school team. And here's something to show you just the kind of player he was. He played for a team called the Indianapolis Kotskis, where he once made 134 consecutive free throws over a 46-game stretch. The current NBA record is only 97 straight free throws by Michael Williams in 1993. At a relatively short height, he dominated basketball at every level he played. But soon it was time to hang up his sneakers and move full-time into coaching. After making a couple of other coaching stops, he would eventually end up as the head coach at UCLA starting in 1948. And there he began to slowly build his program. It would take him 15 years before he would win his first national championship. But once he got that first one, he was on a roll. He would eventually win 10 championships in a 12-year stretch, including a streak of seven straight NCAA championships. Now, it would be easy to compare this run to the Boston Celtics winning eight championships in a row, or the Yankees winning five straight World Series. And those are fair comparisons. I mean, there really aren't that many examples out there of teams putting together long strings of championships. But in the professional leagues, you can keep the same basic roster year after year. That isn't true for college, where your entire roster is turning over every couple of years. Your best players are graduating out almost every single year. Also, the NCAA tournament is a single elimination tournament. One loss and you're out. There is no margin for error. In the professional leagues, they typically play each round as a best of seven. So even if you have a bad game or two, you can still recover and win the series. But at UCLA, 
Wooden had to guide his ever-changing roster to a championship seven years in a row against the best teams in the country in a single elimination format. That is absolutely mind-boggling. I honestly doubt we will ever see anything like that again in men's college basketball. And one of the things that Wooden was known for was never scouting the opponent. He didn't care who his next opponent was or what type of system they ran. He told his team that if they did what they were supposed to do and do it at the highest level, then the game would just take care of itself. So how did he achieve this outlook and this way of preparing his teams? He put together something called the Pyramid of Success. Over the years, he began to pour a lot of time and energy into trying to define success and how to achieve it. Something his father told him when he was a kid was, don't worry about trying to be better than someone else, but never cease trying to be the best that you can be. This was something that he could apply to almost any endeavor in life. So rather than worry about how many games other coaches and teams were winning, he was laser focused on becoming the best coach that he could be and preparing his team to play the best that they could play, and then let the chips fall where they may. This was a huge departure from the way that most ultra-competitive people think. Many competitive people are always comparing themselves to their competition. They are always checking the standings or the rankings. They use it as motivation to get better. Magic Johnson said that every morning he would check the Celtics box score to see what Larry Bird was doing. He was always comparing himself to his greatest competition. But not Coach Wooden. He just focused on himself and his team. And it's hard to argue with the results. He won 10 national championships and twice he had winning streaks of over 85 games. The guy sometimes went years between losses. That's incredible. So let's take a quick break and when we come back we will talk about this pyramid of success that Wooden developed. We're back and we are going to pick up this story with John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. It was a set of 25 character traits that he believed could lead a person or a team to success as he defined it, being the best version of yourself. I'm not going to go through the entire set of 25 traits, but he laid them out as a pyramid where you would start with working on the traits at the bottom row and build yourself up towards the apex of the pyramid. Some of the traits included industriousness, alertness, condition, poise, adaptability, integrity, reliability, and patience, before finally reaching success at the very top of the diagram. I'll put a link in the description to the official John Wooden website where you can go through the pyramid for yourself. If you happen to be a fan of the TV show Parks and Recreation, they parodied Wooden's Pyramid of Success. In the first episode of the third season, the character of Ron Swanson decides to coach a youth basketball team and unveils Ron Swanson's Pyramid of Greatness. That pyramid contained 45 traits such as cabins, self-reliance, woodworking, discipline, cow protein, and buffets. It was a hilarious nod to Coach Wooden. As someone once said, when they parody you, it means you are doing something noteworthy. And Coach Wooden was noteworthy. You can find so many books written about Wooden or written by Wooden. These are incredible books on leadership and doing your best. And in researching this episode, I could only find one instance of anyone saying anything bad about John Wooden and it was said by Bobby Knight so you can take that with a grain of salt Knight had an issue with the way that UCLA recruited back in the 1960s and 70s back then there was a man named Sam Gilbert who was a wealthy athletic booster for UCLA allegedly Gilbert made sure that the best players always ended up at UCLA after an investigation was conducted in 1980, it was discovered that he had been paying players for years to come to UCLA and many feel that this is the big reason why Wooden won so many championships. 
At the end of that investigation, UCLA was put on probation for one year. Of course, Coach Wooden was no longer around. At the time, he had been retired for five years. As far as anyone knows, Wooden took no part in any illegal behavior in his recruiting of high school basketball players. However, it has become obvious that he was aware of Gilbert and Gilbert's activities. But according to Bobby Knight, who once had a conversation about it with Wooden, now I'm going to pause here for a second and put some context around this. Keep in mind that I'm just repeating what Knight has already said on record. Other than Knight's testimony, there is no evidence that this conversation took place. But according to Knight, Wooden told him that he just didn't know how to handle Sam Gilbert. So, he did nothing about Sam Gilbert. And that's what Knight had a problem with. I'll link the article in the show description so that you can read the whole thing for yourself. But you can imagine that Knight would have strangled anybody who dared try the same thing at the University of Indiana where he was coaching. And just to make further connections, this story of recruiting violations as UCLA serves as the premise for the movie Blue Chips, starring Nick Nolte as coach Pete Bell of fictitious Western University. In the movie, Western University wears UCLA colors, and that's not a coincidence. In the movie, Pete Bell is desperate to win another championship, so he allows a booster to get involved in the recruiting process. But regardless of how any individual player arrived at UCLA, it was also no secret that many of the best players chose UCLA without any financial incentive because UCLA were the champions and players liked to be part of a winning team. And if we boil Wooden down to what he did on the court and on game nights, he was still undoubtedly one of the greatest coaches of all time. He deserves to have a place in the Hall of Fame. Let me rephrase that. He deserves to have two places in the Hall of Fame. And the final story that I will share about Wooden is one that tells me about the kind of man that he was. He met his wife Nellie in high school when they were both freshmen. He was 14 years old and she was 13. He was the star of the basketball team and she specifically joined the band so that she could attend every game home and away just to watch him play. They were high school sweethearts. They were married upon his graduation from Purdue University, and they were married for 52 years before a long illness took her in 1985. She attended all of UCLA's home games while he was the coach there, and before each game, he would find her in the stands, make eye contact, and give her the okay sign that he was ready to go. He would go on to live 25 more years as a widower, the story goes that after Nellie died, he never again slept under the covers of his bed. He would sleep on top of the covers with a blanket to keep him warm. He didn't feel it was right to get under the covers without her. And since she died on the 21st of the month, he made it a ritual to visit her resting place on the 21st of every month for nearly 25 years. And when he returned home after each one of those visits, he would write her a love letter. He would then place that letter in an envelope and add it to the stack of envelopes piled up on her pillow in their bedroom. Then on June 4th, 2010, at the age of 99, Coach Wooden's light was extinguished by natural causes. He was laid to rest next to Nellie, his one and only. I wish I could go on. Like I said, there are books and books written about John Wooden. He was an incredible man who made an impact on the lives of so many players, coaches, and leaders. In fact, as I sit here recording this episode, I am looking at the wall of my studio where I have a framed photo of John Wooden and Lou Alcindor, who is now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and they're celebrating another UCLA championship. This is the kind of man that I would have loved to have a conversation with. He deserves the nickname The Wizard of Westwood. Westwood being the section of Los Angeles where UCLA is located. So, there you have it. The story of a man who pursued excellence at everything he did. He was always working to become a better version of himself. Imagine if we all did that. Imagine if we all focused on becoming a better spouse, a better friend, a better parent, 
a better employee, a better leader, and a better example to the people around us. That's the kind of world I would love to live in. Well, that's all for today. Join us next week when we profile the first player born outside of the United States to make an NBA All-Star game. He also published a book of poetry while still an active player. That's next time on Basketball History 101. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.